Well, let me just say here tonight, as you turn to Psalm 2, and we'll look at these verses once again, Psalm 2, that we are honored to be here. Thank you, Pastor Wilkerson, for the privilege, the opportunity, and it's good to see you folks here on a Sunday night being faithful, and we sure appreciate your church. We've come here many, many times to pastor schools through the years and brought uh, groups for different events, and we just so appreciate your testimony and your uh, faithfulness, and we are uh, glad to be here and be a part of this this week. We're praying for just a great week. I'll tell you, I, I never really saw this coming as far as a ministry, but God did put a burden in my heart many years ago for our country. And obviously, if you're a Christian, you understand we're in the midst of a spiritual war. And you, can't, you really can't make sense out of the evening news unless you look at it through the lens of the spiritual war that we're in. But once you look at it through God's Word and begin to shine light on it from that angle, everything begins to make sense. And it is truly something that we're burdened about. Our desire is to educate and inspire this generation with the principles of freedom. And that would include personal freedom through Jesus Christ, who frees us from the chains of sin, but also political freedom, as it can be wrapped up in uh, economic freedom, religious freedom, and then political freedom in our nation. So it's, it all works together, and there's a spiritual foundation underneath all of it, and that's what we're going to look at tonight. Uh, let me just thank my wife and uh, son for traveling along and being such an important part of this ministry. I love and appreciate them, and we're glad to have Daniel back from college for a little while to, to be with us. And we have two other boys back in the Springfield, Missouri area, and more importantly, we have three grandkids and two on the way. So by August, we should have five grandkids, five years old and under, and that makes me really excited for Thanksgiving and Christmas, because it's going to be interesting. And uh, I'm, I love this grandparenting thing, it's just that I'm not old enough for it, but uh, other than that, it's, it's great. Uh, let me also mention out there on the table, we do have a few things that we carry along, these are... Uh, everything on the table has helped us tremendously in this ministry and just given us such a, a broader view of what's really going on. And I'll just mention two things here in particular. America's Guide and Country, Encyclopedia of Quotations. If you don't have this, this is a tremendous resource of quotes regarding faith, the Bible, prayer, morality, Jesus Christ. And these are all from the pilgrims and from our founders and from presidents all the way up through the years. But it's uh, there's a lot of historical revision going on. It's hard to argue with their direct quotes. And this book is powerful for uh, Sunday school lessons or preaching, uh, that kind of thing. Also, there's a, that's my favorite book. This is my wife's favorite book, Miracles in American History, 32 Amazing Stories of Answered Prayer. Times in America's history when our back was against the wall. And as a nation, we prayed, cried out to God, had national days of fasting and prayer. And God heard the prayers and delivered us. These are the amazing accounts that are left out of today's history books, but they're absolutely true. And we need to be familiar with these things. It'll build our faith. And uh, then I'll show one more thing here. This is actually uh, something we just got uh, to put together this week. Six DVDs of our live presentations, all with PowerPoint included, and it covers uh, the spiritual war for the nations, the moral war in the nation, faith that faces tyrants, a walk through the founding documents, God, morals, and socialism, and then our call to action. So we've got a limited supply of these, but we'd like to make those available as well uh, to watch. So let's jump right into Psalm 2 after we have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless. Thank you. Lord, for this opportunity, and we thank you for everyone that's here tonight. I thank you for those that are saved, those that are not saved. I pray that you'd speak to every heart. Thank you for the Word of God, the ancient, eternal truth that is forever settled in heaven. And Lord, no matter what happens on this earth, we know your Word is reliable, it is true. We can build not only our lives on it, but our eternity on it. And we thank you for the Word of God. Help us now open our spiritual eyes that we might see what you would have for us in this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 2, starting again there in verse number 1, the Bible says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? I love looking into these words and making sure that I'm understanding them correctly. So in the Hebrew, if you look up heathen, it, it's actually referring to Gentile nations. 
this psalm is directed to the nations. And the Bible is, is asking, why do the heathen, why do these nations rage? We've seen a lot of rage lately on the evening news, haven't we? So, but apparently it's not anything new. Keep in mind, this was written roughly 3,000 years ago. But mankind had the problem then. The Bible says there in verse 1, the people imagine a vain thing. That means it is fruitless. It's not productive. And yet they continue to think this way, even though it is not really helping them. Verse 2 says, the kings of the earth or the leaders of these nations set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. In other words, these nations down here on earth. They're led by individuals who think a certain way, typically, and who think like the others think. In fact, often they would look around and say, well, that's what everybody else thinks, therefore it must be right. I think that too. They take counsel together about what? Two things. Number one, they're against the Lord. That's interesting to me. Why would the kings be against the Lord? This word is actually Jehovah, and it means the eternal one, the self-existent one. Cre or evolution tries to teach us that everything we see right now came from something else, which came from something else, which came from something else. And sooner or later you realize you get, you've got to get back to a point where something didn't come from something else. Science has no answer for that. Time, space, matter, energy, it, it, it's not self-existent. In fact, they don't know anything that's self-existent, so the best they can come up with is that nothing was condensed down into a dot the size of a period, and one day nothing exploded and became everything. That's what we're teaching our kids. Well, the Bible says no. There is one who is self-existent. His name is the I Am. He's the cause of all the other causes. And so the Bible says for some reason these kings have a problem with him. They are against him. Maybe it's because if he's the creator, he's also the judge. Notice secondly, they're not only against the creator, but they're against his anointed. Now without going and taking a lot of time, that's Jesus. And we'll see that very clearly here in just a moment, but... I find it pretty fascinating that the kings of the earth were against the Creator and Jesus. By the way, this is a thousand years before Jesus was born. Why would they be against Him then? But you know, amazingly, it sounds a lot like our world today. It's not that these kings aren't religious or spiritual in some way. Just don't bring the Creator into it and certainly don't bring Jesus into it. I mean, they subscribe to all kinds of religions. In fact, they didn't mind if you worship them. Just don't bring the Creator or Jesus into it. Verse 3 tells us why. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Bands. That's an interesting word. It means a halter or a restraint. Properly, it means chastisement. So it has the idea that God has put boundaries around us, and we don't like those boundaries. And we need to break those boundaries. We need to do what we want to do. We don't need God hemming us in and restricting us. And we sure don't want Him to chasten us if we disobey Him. Then the word cords, very similar. A band, a rope, or something that entwines. So their idea is, you know... Man's problem is not really our sin nature, our wickedness, our desire to hurt others. That's not the problem. The problem is God's Word. The problem is God's moral law that He's tried to put on us. And if we really want to be free, we need to break through these archaic ideas that there's a God in heaven and that He has told us what is right and wrong and that He will punish sin. The problem with that is it's making us all feel guilty. So the guilt isn't because we really are guilty. The guilt is because of all these Bible preachers and Christians that run around reminding us of God's Word. We need to break through that so we can truly be free. And that's the message of these kings. 
Verse 4 gives us God's reaction to that. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. In other words, it doesn't matter what these kings do or say about God, God's still God. He's still on the throne, he's still in control, and he is going to deal with sin. And there's not a thing in the world we can do. Proverbs 11 says it doesn't matter if we join hand in hand, the wicked shall be punished. So we can get a whole bunch of us to say, well, we don't agree with God, and we don't want God involved in our lives. It doesn't matter how many folks join hands. God's still God. Then, I love this next, these next two verses, talking about the anointed one. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. We're talking about Jesus, who's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem, Zion. And so he's saying, in spite of all these kings being against me and against Jesus and against Israel, Jesus will come and he will rule and reign and there's not a thing in the world these kings can do to stop it. And if you have any doubt that we're talking about Jesus, look at verse 7. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. As clear as John 3.16. So that's really what it boils down to. Do you realize that's what it's always boiled down to? From Genesis chapter 3, when the, uh, when the Lord said that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. From that point all the way down through, it's always been about God's plan of salvation. In fact, if we fast forward to the book of Revelation and see the Lord and the Lamb, it will still be about them. Now, if we go down to verse number 11, this is what the instruction is to these nations. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. If He is the Creator... Don't reject Him. Don't run away from Him. Don't try to break through His commands. Just serve Him. Just serve Him. That's where joy comes from. Rejoice with trembling. You're not going to have joy any other way. Just surrender to Him. And then, what about Jesus? Look at verse 12. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish from the way. If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by Him, and if there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, don't reject Him. Don't curse Him. Don't blaspheme Him. Run to Him. Embrace Him. Kiss Him. Thank Him for dying on Calvary for your sins and making a way of salvation for you. Listen. The only way to be blessed is through the Son of God. He says the last line, blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. I love the word blessed because it's opposite of vain back in verse 1. Vain means fruitless. Blessed means fruitful. So you really want to be fruitful, productive? Turn to Jesus. Now, it's amazing to me, they were having this problem a long time ago. So whatever's going on in America right now isn't anything new, is it? In fact, let's go think about a few things in light of this text and our nation. Ephesians 6, Paul said, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, that is, people. The atheist authors, the liberal professors, and politicians... It's really not the people, it's principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. Sometimes we just kind of need to back out, zoom out, and get the 30,000 foot view and realize, you know, it's not so much my neighbor that's the problem or uh, this person that's a problem or this actor. It's much bigger than that. There is a war going on for the soul of this nation and every nation. So... There's a war, and this war is spiritual. Let me just give you some quotes from different world leaders. And again, I'm not interested in politics so much, uh, although it's all connected. Our purpose tonight is really to look at this from the spiritual side. What do these leaders, these kings of these nations, say? And we'll just uh, look at evidence here of the spiritual battle. We'll start with Karl Marx. My object in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. 
On the other hand, George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Joseph Stalin, Marxist, Soviet Union, God's not unjust, he doesn't actually exist. We've been deceived. If God existed, he would have made the world more just. Benjamin Franklin. Freedom is not a gift bestowed upon us by other men, but a right that belongs to us by the laws of God and nature. Adolf Hitler, Nazi Germany. The Fuhrer is deeply religious, though completely anti-Christian. He views Christianity as a symptom of decay. In early 1937, he was declaring that Christianity was ripe for destruction and that the churches must yield to the primacy of the state. Hitler's outlook was based on the certainty that the progress of science would destroy all myths and had already proved Christian doctrine to be an absurdity. Once the war was over, Hitler promised himself he would root out and destroy the influence of the Christian churches. Sounds like a spiritual aspect to me. Patrick Henry said it is impossible that a nation of infidels or idolaters should be a nation of free men. It's when a people forget God that tyrants forge their chains. It cannot be emphasized too strongly that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded freedom of worship here. Vladimir Lenin, Soviet Union. Religion is one of the forms of spiritual oppression which everywhere weighs down heavily upon the masses of the people. Religion is a sort of spiritual booze in which the slaves of capital drown their human image. So it's just a crutch you lean on. John Witherspoon said he is the best friend to American liberty who is most sincere and active in promoting true and undefiled religion. Whoever is an avowed enemy of God, I scruple not to call him an enemy of his country. Mussolini, fascist of Italy, he proclaimed himself to be an atheist and several times tried to shock an audience by calling on God to strike him dead. He believed that science had proven there was no God and that the historical Jesus was ignorant and mad. He said a lot of other blasphemous things about Jesus Christ. He considered religion a disease of the psyche and accused Christianity of promoting cowardice. Samuel Adams, the right to freedom being the gift of God Almighty, the rights of the colonists as Christians, may best be understood by reading and carefully studying the New Testament. Mao Zedong, China, he was opposed to religion. People were told to become atheists from the early days of communist rule. Chinese Marxists declared the death of God and considered religion a defilement of the Chinese communist vision. Clergy or preachers were arrested and sent to camps. Thomas Jefferson, Almighty God who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech Thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of Thy favor and glad to do Thy will. In time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness. And in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in Thee to fail. All of which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we could go on and on with these kinds of quotes because literally there are volumes of books written about this. And it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to look into it and begin to see that folks are on one side or the other in this spiritual battle, and there's definitely a battle going on. We feel it every day in our hearts. It's a very real spiritual war. Am I going to do the right thing or not? But you know, it's also in our families. We're all praying for loved ones that they'll do the right thing. But that spiritual war is just as real on a national level at your state capitals, even city and local uh, uh, 
uh, capitals, uh, headquarters, uh, and uh, certainly at Washington, D.C. And if you talk with any senator or congressman long enough, you'll understand that they are under a lot of pressure, and things get crazy when they get to D.C., and it has to do with this spiritual warfare that's going on. Jesus said there's really only two sides. The, the enemy of God, the thief, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. So the enemy of God promotes a culture of death, stealing, killing, and destroying. He also said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So he promotes a culture of life, and so do those who follow him. And there you have basically the two sides. Now, if I were to look back through history and try to figure out what side everyone was on, it wouldn't be that hard to figure it out. So let's start with Nimrod. This, he's mentioned in Genesis 10 and 11 as a mighty hunter, great and mighty. He's the one that led mankind to build this tower. Uh, the, in that definition for great and mighty is the word tyrant. And Josephus wrote about Nimrod. Of course, Josephus was during the time of Christ, a Jewish historian. But listen to his testimony about Nimrod. He says it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. In other words, to be mad at God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded, uh, persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe it was their own courage which procured that happiness. Stop giving God the glory for everything. You deserve the glory. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power. That's an amazing quote. So you've got a world leader using the power of government to do what? To steer people away from their faith in God. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God. Remember Psalm 2 talking about uh, breaking these bands and breaking God's punishment, and we don't want God to, to have that much control in our life? It's exactly Nimrod's attitude. We want to do what we want to do, and we don't want you punishing us. And if you ever build, uh, send a flood like this again, we're building a tower that we can escape your judgment. Nim, uh, Josephus went on to say, the multitude were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod and to esteem it a piece of cowardice to submit to God. That sounds just like Mussolini and these other guys we just quoted. Your faith is it's just weakness. It's just a spiritual crutch. You know, you can't face reality. You know that lie is about 4,500 years old because here's Nimrod saying it. They built a tower burnt, uh, of burnt brick, cemented together with mortar that it might not be liable to admit water. When God saw that they acted so madly, he caused a tumult among them by pr producing in them diverse languages and causing that they should not be able to understand one another. The place wherein they built the tower is now called Babylon, for the Hebrews mean by the word Babel, confusion. So the first mention of Babylon, you've got Nimrod, a one world leader, rallying everyone together to do what? Shake their fist at God and blaspheme the Creator. You go into the book of Daniel, you see Babylon again. Nebuchadnezzar. Bow to this image or I'll burn you alive. Saying how great is Babylon? What is it? It's a one world kingdom again with this tyrant trying to turn people away from God. You fast forward to Revelation, Babylon's mentioned again. A one world leader getting everyone together to do what? Blaspheme God. In spite of all the witnesses, in spite of all the plagues, or, and the voice of God trying to turn people to repentance. So there's a spiritual war for the nations that's been going on a long time, and we just happen to find ourselves in the middle of it. So, you think about Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, the Caesars, Genghis Khan, and thousands of other tyrants. Many of these received worship. They claimed to be divine. They were more than happy to put themselves in the place of God. And throughout history, you see this struggle. It's either going to be in God we trust, or in government we trust. We're either going to submit to the Creator, the King of the Kings, or we're going to submit to one of the kings. Satan has worked 
through the millennia to control the nations. Let's fast forward to Charles Darwin, 1800s. God's not the creator. Comes up with a scientific model minus God. We don't need him in our explanation of how we got here. During that same time period, you have Frederick Nietzsche began the God is Dead movement, came up with a philosophical model minus God. We don't, we don't need to think about God when it comes to guilt and our conscience and, and all of this. There is no God. During that same time period, you have Karl Marx, atheist, who built on Darwin and Nietzsche's ideas and develops communism, which is what? A political system minus God. How can we set up a utopia on this earth and uh, do it without God? Interestingly, this was in the 1850s, shortly after the birth of America, right after de Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America and talked about how, how our faith and our preaching and our righteousness had exalted us as a nation. I just find it pretty interesting this guy shows up right after that and says, I think we can do it without God. By the way, his, his doctrine has poisoned literally every nation now, including ours. Karl Marx said this in his early 20s, I wish to avenge myself against the one who rules above. Sounds like Nimrod. He also said the first requisite for the happiness of the people is the abolition of religion. We've got to get rid of of religion if we're ever really going to be happy. By the way, that was not coming from a happy guy. Karl Marx had no reputation for being happy. The Fabian Society was Marxist that came to America in 1883, introducing socialism here. The Frankfurt schools were in the early 1900s doing the same thing, and their goal was to, to transform America through our education system. Then you've got William Foster. I've had this book for years and pulled it out the last couple of years. He published it in 1932 toward a Soviet America trying to convince us that communism was much better than our founding. So we'll quote him in just a moment. Gramsci dies in 1937. He had already written 2,000 pages on how to take down a Judeo-Christian culture from the inside. He said, this guy's from Italy. And he's on the other side of the ocean trying to figure out how can we destroy America. He says we need to use Hollywood, the universities, the education system, journalism, and even churches to undermine the morals and character. I'm just trying to point out that this is a spiritual war. And the enemies of God aren't necessarily interested or able to use their militaries or their money. But they are going after our morals. And to them, that's where the battle really is and has been for quite some time. John Dewey, viewed as an icon here in America for our education system, was fascinated with Karl Marx. Actually went to Russia in 1928 to discuss education with them. He was an atheist, a socialist, a humanist, and secularized our K-12 system here in America, trying to get God out of the textbooks and out of our uh, education. I want to fast forward to Saul Alinsky, 1971, writes Rules for Radicals, to lay out plans for community organizers to stir things up and to pit the haves and the have-nots against each other. If united we stand, he knew that divided we would fall. So divide. You want to fundamentally transform a, a nation? Divide them into all kinds of small groups and then agitate. And then bring in protesters and bring in the media and stir this up so the government can come in and fix it. Why would I point him out? Because of the dedication of his book. Lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical, the first radical known to man, who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. So this book that literally is still available in bookstores right now, and uh, it was uh, part of what shaped our last president and his thinking. And uh, in fact, Hillary Clinton uh, knew Saul Alinsky personally and was mentored by him and wrote her thesis work on his writings. Uh, this is very relevant, but I just want to point out the spiritual fingerprints that are on this. This is a spiritual war for this nation. 
which started off as one nation under God. The enemy's tactics, Jesus said they're going to lie. They have a real problem with the truth. And uh, Foster said in that book in 1937, in the USSR, as it must be in any socialist country, religion dies out in the midst of the growing culture. As the factories and schools open, the churches close. Under the American Soviet government, schools, colleges, and universities will be coordinated and grouped under the National Department of Education. And studies will be revolutionized, being cleansed of religious, patriotic, and other features of bourgeois ideology or capitalism. So he's just saying, look, we're going we're gonna to change this country through the education system and by reprogramming the way everyone thinks about God, about America's founding. Science will become materialistic, hence truly scientific. God will be banished from the laboratories as well as from the schools. This is back when we still taught creation in our schools. Munzenberg was a German that said, we need to organize the intellectuals and use them to make Western civilization stink. Only then, after they've corrupted all its values, can we impose the dictatorship. Just quote after quote, talking about the spiritual side of this. Now here's Solzhenitsyn, which was a Russian that came from uh, the Gulag prison camps over there to America to try to help us. And the talk he went around the country giving was godlessness, the first step to the gulag. He said they had to get the educated class, the college professors, to abandon God and embrace secularism and atheism to get the whole country to move in this direction. They started with the universities. They started with the intellectuals. The tenacity with which the hatred of religion is rooted in communism may be judged by the example of Khrushchev. Khrushchev rekindled the frenzied Leninist obsession with destroying religion and they turned churches into museums about atheism. Kids were separated from their parents and their faith. Kids were taken to public schools to be indoctrinated with communist concepts and new morality. A tyrant wants to control his subjects. He's an absolute ruler. And William Foster said, we need to have the press, the motion picture, and the radio, and the theater taken over by the government so we can control what people hear and see. Solzhenitsyn said, for tens of millions of laymen, access to the church was blocked and they were forbidden to bring up their children in the faith. It's just amazing to me, the attack on faith, on God, on the Lord Jesus, on the Word of God. Religious parents were wrenched from their children and thrown into prison. Children were turned from the faith by threats and lies. These are actions of a tyrant. I'm going to skip through that for sake of time and just point out this. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He was a murderer from the beginning. The devil doesn't mind killing. In fact, he thinks that's part of what he has to do to accomplish his goals. You know, it's interesting that Marxism became the greatest killing machine in history, responsible for the mass murder of more people in times of war than all the wars of history combined. Millions upon millions in the 1900s alone, 60 million in communist China killed, 80 million in communist, I'm sorry, Russia, 80 million in China. Congressional records tell us 135 million killed in the 20th century by this poisonous ideology. Now let me contrast that in closing with America. What makes this nation so different? Two things, their treatment of the Creator. The founders wrote in our very first document, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they're endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Psalm 2 says, serve the Lord. And then you can rejoice in trembling. You can uh, understand what it is to find purpose and joy in life. Our founders did not run from the Creator. In fact, Samuel Adams said, as they were signing that document, We have this day restored the sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven and from the rising to the setting of the sun. They knew exactly what they were doing. Putting the Lord where He deserves to be, above any king or president or person. John Adams said the general principles on which the founders achieved independence were the principles of Christianity. He ought to know he was one of them. Amen. And so he was there, our second president, heavily involved in the revolution. And he says, these were principles of Christianity that this was built on. Psalm 2 said, kiss the Son. 
Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. They were not ashamed of Jesus. 52 out of 56 of the signers were avowed Christians openly. They were not ashamed to pray in Jesus' name. In fact, John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, said from the day of the declaration they were bound by the laws of God, which they all, and by the laws of the gospel, which they nearly all, acknowledge as the rules of their conduct. Congress even said in 1854, the great vital element in our system is the belief in our people in the pure doctrines and divine truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. America is under a spiritual attack, and we have to fight back on a spiritual level because that's where the war really is. I'll close with this quote by the Russian. He said, all attempts to find a way out of the plight of today's world are fruitless unless we redirect our consciousness in repentance to the Creator of all. Without this, no exit will be illumined and we shall seek it in vain. We're not going to fight our way out of America's problems with our military. We're not going to spend our way out of America's problems with our wealth. America's problem is spiritual. There's only one exit. Get back to the Creator and let Him bless us. We can start that tonight. We can teach our kids the truth about the Creator and about what our founders said. And isn't it amazing that America would be under such an intense attack? I mean, if there's a flag burning on the evening news, it's probably Israel or America. Why is there such a hatred for this freedom? And yet, it's very real. We see the Spirit of Antichrist forming and, and the anti-Semitism again around the globe. And America seems to be right in the middle of it. And that's us, by the way. We are America. It's, it's God's people throughout this land that have the answer. It was God's people at the beginning, and it'll be God's people today that take a stand, get back to the Creator, get back to His precious Son, without apology. It's the only hope for our nation. Lord, help us tonight. Thank you for these wonderful truths, and I do ask that you would continue to work in our hearts and give us the wisdom we desperately need. Please help us. In Jesus' name.